Hey guys, it's Tamara. Thank you so much for coming back to my channel. Welcome back. We're going to talk today about a theory on child development and that theory is pretty interesting. It's pretty controversial as well. There's a lot going on with this theory. There's a lot of research that's been done in the past. There's been a lot of discussions about this. There's been um, a lot of research on it. And the topic is birth order. Um, I, I have found that in my practice of, of, of counseling and, and teaching families, parents, caregivers, and their children, you know, the birth order does have some impact, uh, but I'm not sure I agree that every family functions according to birth order. Um, and, I, and that's even true in my own family. So we're going to just jump on into this topic and uh, I'd like to know what you guys think about it because it's something I'm sure has come up in your family um, based on birth order, probably different characteristics, personalities, whatever that you've noticed. And it seems to be a perpetuation or a continuation uh, throughout your, your family. So we're going to go ahead and just get started with that. So thank you so much for those who have come back to my channel, who have been subscribed and participating. Thank you so much. And for those who are not subscribed, I encourage you to hit the subscribe button right over here so you can stick around with us, learn and grow and make suggestions on videos. The benefits for you today is that you're going to learn a little bit about family roles in addition to birth order. And I want to give you uh, just a little bit of background on myself and my own family, um, just to kind of use myself as an example to give you some ideas. All right. So, okay, so first, what in the world is birth order? Well, birth order is the theory that certain personality and characteristics are dependent upon where you've been born within your family. The theory comes from child developmental theorist uh, Alfred Adler, and he studied development and personality throughout the lifespan. And one of the theories he came up with, which kind of uh, grew out of his own family background and his own awareness of, of he and his siblings, uh, what kind of grew out of that was the theory that individuals who are born first, second, or third. Sorry, guys, I had to get that phone call, so I apologize for the brief stop in the video. But um, what kind of grew out of that theory is that kids who are born first, second, or third tend to have emotional and psychological challenges or certain personality characteristics that makes their place within their family slightly difficult or challenging. So for example, uh, first kids may have a specific set of characteristics that makes it difficult for them to kind of get the love and the nurturing that they need because they're often seen as the older, the more mature, and they're also seen as the more independent typically. Uh, you might also get a parentified child if the individual is older. For middle kids, uh, there's a running theory that they tend to um, be spoiled, some of them, or they feel overlooked, or they feel that they're squished between two good places, right? Somebody who's getting most of the attention because they're mature and advanced, and a younger sibling who's getting the most attention because they're the baby of the family. So birth order is said to affect all of those things, okay? So I want to talk uh, briefly about uh, family roles and what that looks like and what the consequences are of being placed in that family role. Now, one of the things I've learned in my own family is that uh, it's very easy for for parents to kind of push their children into certain roles, not knowing that they are, but just the way that the family dynamic goes can push the child into a family role. Now, the first role that I often see, especially in families such as mine, is the hero role. Role. There's one person who is tagged the hero, and that's the one who rescues the family. That's the one who got married on time. That's the one who graduated college and grad school. That's the one who um, is doing everything according to the rules. There's no mess ups. There's no issues nothing. That's the family hero. Now, what typically goes wrong with the family hero is that there's a fear of failure. And that happened to be me when I was starting out in college at age 17 and a half, almost 18. I went early and uh, I had a little bit of a fear of failure. Well, what if I, what if I fail? And I would graduate one year of college and be like, okay, I'm not going to make it through my second. I would make it through my second and look back and say, okay, I'm not going to get through my third. And when I got to grad school, eight years like after going through graduate school and grad school and I graduated eight years later, I'm like, oh my God. But I had this internal fear of failure. I was the family hero in my family between two boys. So uh, that's a lot of pressure. My cousin as well, uh, I think one of my first cousins 
was also the family hero in her situation. And there's just a lot of pressure that's placed on you as the family hero. It can be very, very overwhelming. The next is the scapegoat or the black sheep of the family. And that's the individual that gets tagged as being the issue when the issue is everybody in that family unit. But that one child gets tagged as the problem. They're the, they're the black sheep. Uh, what typically happens to these kids is that they feel rejected. They feel angry and resentful. They internalize their emotions and they shut down. They don't want to deal with being tagged the black sheep of the family no matter what they do no matter what they do how they do it when they do it it doesn't matter they're constantly tagged as the scapegoat the scapegoat excuse me and the black the black sheep of the family the lost child is the younger sibling the baby of the family they tend to be lost they tend to be quiet and they tend to go over in the corner and hide. It's a lot easier. They also watch with really good eyeglasses, right? They constantly have their lens focused on all the family drama and all the family issues. That burdens them. And so then they internalize and they go away. And they're lost in a sense. They don't know who they are. They don't know what they want to be. And they're afraid to step anywhere where there may be a landmine because they've seen it blow up before and they don't want to be a part of that. So the lost child is typically the quiet one who's lonely. They go over in the corner and they hide it safer. The final uh, family role that we tend to play is the mascot or the family clown. This family member hides their pain. They cloak their pain. They internalize and push down their pain. And they become the family jokester. It's so much easier to joke about everything, smile about everything, minimize everything, deny everything, right? You might see this individual make jokes about really um, heinous things like murder or crime. It's not always that they're in sensitive it's a coping mechanism it's how they've learned to manage and deal with their emotions so family roles are are very powerful within families and whether or not you identify these patterns can really depend on 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 what position and role that you play right so you may play the hero in your family or you may pl play the scapegoat who knows but it's typically an individual outside of the family unit who can look in and say okay that's the role you're playing that's the role you're playing i also want to mention too that you can actually play various roles and you can play many of these roles in your family depending on the year depending on what's going on depending on the trauma in your family or depending on who you know who you're close with and who you're not close with so you know one thing Alfred Adler missed and and this is just my own humble opinion is not every family is the same and these roles aren't fixed categories it's very variable right we play different roles depending on where we are in our families who we are who we're with how we think how we react our maturity level our culture all of that right the politics in our family so it's not fixed right we also I think believe that these family roles paint your identity forever. And that's another thing Alfred Adler missed, that we can outgrow those roles and we can change. So, you know, I think, you know, any psychological theory, we need to be reminded that, that we don't fit these roles 100%, that they're variable. Like a diagnostic category, it's variable. You can't just put somebody in a role and say, okay, that's who you are forever. It's just not how it goes. So thank you so much, guys, for being with me in this video today. If it was helpful, please give it a thumbs up, share it, and comment in the comment section below. I'm going to post a previous video in the description box for you, and I'm also going to post some articles that I did in the past about family order and family family uh, roles and behaviors. So I will see you guys with a new video on Monday. We're going to talk about psychosis and shared psychosis. So stick around for that. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.